Good afternoon. Welcome to this Education Week teacher webinar, Personalizing Math Instruction Using Technology. If you like math, technology, or instruction, then boy, have you found the right webinar. I'm your host today, your moderator, Ross Brenneman, and I'm an assistant editor for Education Week Teacher, which you can follow on Twitter at EdWeekTeacher. You can also follow me at It's a Pun, and I highly recommend doing that. So, uh, let's talk about what's happening today. Uh, uh, a little over a month ago, a teacher put out a special report on personalized learning. Uh, it looked at uh, the cross-section between technology and uh, this method of instruction, uh, covering everything from personalized learning to the slightly different, different uh, you know, student-centered learning, differentiated instruction, and blended learning. And blended learning has become, as many of you may know, a, uh, a pretty big area in, uh, in education. Um, it's pretty burgeoning, um, and uh, as one of our stories said, many teachers remain skeptical of school and district efforts to merge instruction with digital devices. Uh, there have been uh, some horror stories. There have been uh, many success stories, too. Uh, with us today, uh, we have uh, uh, an expert in this field, um, Silvestre Arcos, uh, wrote for us in an in a op-ed for that package how leveraging technology has allowed me to meet my students' individual needs and push them at their current levels of proficiency. And he is going to be joining us here today uh, as our expert. Uh, he is the founding fifth grade math teacher at KIPP Washington Heights Middle School. He holds a master's in bilingual and bicultural education from Teachers College at Columbia University. He was a 2011 winner of Teaching Tolerance's Culturally Responsive Teaching Award and a 2013 winner of New York City's Big Apple Award for Teaching Excellence. Hi, Silver. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Fantastic. Very good time. Yeah, uh, so but I'm going to give you a chance to take one last breath before I, I turn it over to you uh, and just go over a couple okay. of technical things. Um, by now, everyone has uh, figured out that there's a group chat function. Uh, uh, enjoy using that. If you have questions, submit them through the, the little question box at the bottom, not through the chat. You can submit them through the chat. We just might miss them. Uh, and uh, uh, as you can see from the screen, the, uh, an archive of this webinar will be available in less than 24 hours at that link. Uh, and that will also come with a transcript of uh, today's, well, not a transcript of today's webinar, but a transcript of the group chat. So you don't have to worry about saving all of that we'll do it for you. Uh, last thing is uh, we love questions. Uh, Silver here is going to answer a ton of them. Uh, so, so don't worry about when you're submitting them. We will still see them. And because this is an autocracy, if we like them, uh, it's not a first come, first serve. So you might ask them. Uh, and last thing, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Dreambox Learning, who you'll be hearing from a little bit later today. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to you, Silver. <laughs> hi, uh, hi everybody. I'm glad that y'all were able to make it today in the, the middle of the afternoon. Um, and thank you, Russ, for the introduction. Um, I want to first talk about this, this initial slide with the picture. So here we see two of my students in the computation class that we, have in, that we had in the lunchroom last year. And so one way for me to wrap up the session was to tell the students to put their hands on their head so that if they would uh, so that they would stop working and they would be able to track me. But you see this little guy towards the, the front, he's actually still working on his iPad with his elbow because he was just so engaged. And I, I love this picture. Uh, and I think it says a lot. Um, so um, I want to I wanna, I wanna just let people know. So blended learning is something that is actually new to me. I have been, this is my, 14th year in the classroom, and for the first 12 years or so, I I work I, I taught in a more traditional direct instruction manner, where I would be in front of 30 or so students with one lesson, uh, which is what you typically would see in the classroom. And um, coming to Kip Washington Heights and talking to my principal, uh, he threw this idea at me about using instructional technology in order to personalize the instruction for each one of our students, which is something that we do across the school, but 
uh, me being the math teacher, I specifically worked on improving the model for, for math instruction. And so what we do here at school, uh, the question that we wanted to grapple with is how do we personalize instruction in the math classroom using instructional technology? And so we have students at a variety of proficiency levels here in Washington Heights in New York City. We have about 20% of our students uh, are classified as e English language learners, and another 20% of them have uh, an IEP, so they're classified as uh, they receive special ed services. And then we have students without any services that are way below grade level, at grade level, and then there, there are very few, but there are still some that were, came to us at above grade level. And so the way that I've been shifted in my, in my, I guess, my model or my way of thinking about education is to decrease the, the, the amount of whole group direct instruction that I give. And by doing that, I increase the, num the amount of small group homogenous instruction based on the, on the data that I, that I collect from students. And so my role as a teacher has changed from one where it's like a very teacher-centered classroom, uh, and now I'm more of a facilitator and a coach. And so I had to, I had to adjust my teaching style that way. Um, I, I, I also have been encouraging students to work more independently and so increase their autonomy in the classroom in this new role. Um, the student's role has also changed in, the, in that the students are not sort of just sitting there and, 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 and just going along with the lesson. They're actually uh, encouraged a whole lot to become masters of their own learning and make decisions on the, to guide their own instruction based on, based on their data and the, based on, a, on, on our feedback. Um, the way that if there are any people on the, uh, in the webinar that are like at the school administration level, I would say that something that, that, that can be done and, and has been really important for us at our school uh, in order for us to be successful is that we need, uh, we need to make sure that the school administration really values the model that we're using and, and to, to help us by, by, by incorporating, giving us that time as part of our schedule. Um, and uh, also making sure that we get, uh, there's an emphasis on instructional coaching and the, including an emphasis on, on having a growth mindset both for students and for teachers. And then lastly, I would say that it's really important that the school administration uh, provides a culture where innovation and trying out new ideas is, is valued and supported. Um, one of the big shifts for me as a teacher is, is letting go of control, right? So when you're one of the, if you're the only, if you're the only teacher in the classroom and you prepare your lesson for your group of students, um, having a teacher-centered classroom, it, it allows for a lot of control. Um, now, using this blended learning model, it, it, it gets a little messier, it gets a little, maybe it even gets a little louder. Um, but, but allowing for students to make decisions and drive their own instruction has proven really successful for us. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the model that we use here at school. Um, we have, we, we differentiated math instruction at our school. Um, we, did, we have a, a computation math block and we have a problem solving math block as well. The students receive computation class twice a week for about an hour, and those classes are around 50 students each. Um, the problem solving class is every day for about an hour with a group of about 30 students. And in the computation block, students are mostly working on their own device, whether it's an iPad, a laptop, or a Chromebook. And they can be working independently, or they could be working in pairs collaboratively. In the problem solving class, that's where I look at the data, I make groups based on the data, and I provide the instruction, which is common core line, in the small heterogeneous groups. Um, 
and I and I do and it, and it focuses a whole lot on modeling a lot of the progressions that Common Core asked for. Um, here in this in this photograph, you you see that students are working independently on their own device. And in this particular photograph, it was just me with about 50 students. And you can see that everyone is engaged, mostly because everyone is working at their own level and is able to solve their own problems. Um, so these are the two programs that we mostly use here at our school. Uh, we use STMAT and we also use Khan Academy. They complement each other. And um, I would say some of the benefits of STMAT is that they, they focus, there's a, a big focus on visual learning. The students solve puzzles without the use of, of words, right? And so there are pre and post quizzes in that program. There's content for students from kindergarten all the way through sixth grade. Now, here the, the, the tough part about it is that there is limited choice. The teacher decides in what order the content is, um, is organized. With Khan Academy, students are free to jump around, even though the teacher is able to recommend skills. And we use Khan Academy to check for students' mastery of certain skills. The reports on Khan Academy are excellent. And more as time goes by, the exercises are becoming more and more Common Core aligned, um, which is really important for us in New York. So like I said earlier, my role in the classroom has become more of a facilitator or coach. So I guide students by organizing the content and create playlists. On the top photograph, you see one of the playlists for the Unit 3 skills that align to the exercises on Khan Academy. And so the students are free pretty much to decide in what order they want to, they want to show mastery on each one of these skills, um, but obviously, the teacher's role is in providing feedback, making sure that you conference with the students, and helping them look at their own data to see, well, well the choices that I made this week or last week or today are going to be the choices that are going to help me complete this playlist, be successful on this unit. Um, it also helps, looking at the reports also helps for accountability. And I would say that another, another emphasis for accountability is on the mastery grades that we give to our students. Um, the students' mastery on Khan Academy, for example, uh, is included in their, in their quarterly report card grades. The other role that I play as a facilitator and coach is to making sure that I celebrate students' successes. So I post students energy points up in the classroom, the number of skills that they've mastered. Once the students uh, have mastered a certain number of skills, we, uh, we get the students with the grit shirt that you see right under there. And I'll speak a little bit about grit and our other character strengths in a minute. Um, and uh, there are other celebrations such as the math is life party where students are able to celebrate at the end of the quarter if they have mastered a certain number of skills for that quarter. One of the biggest things that's important for, for me as a teacher to, to help the students understand is what to do when they're stuck. And this is where the role of showing grit and optimism comes in. And so it's important that we model strategies of what to do when we get stuck. So for example, on Khan Academy, when students are stuck, they're, they're able to go and watch a video if they want to. They could ask for a hint. They could ask for an example of how to solve the, the skill. And then they'll get another skill to try it out on their own. Or if there is a, there, if there's a model of collaboration like you see in the photograph, then the, the, the students could help each other out here. Um, and, and so if there is a model of collaboration, then it's really important that you talk about social intelligence as far as making sure that both of the students are doing the heavy lifting so that they're both pushing themselves and not only one, you don't have the, the I guess the more traditional model of one student tutoring another, but both students are kind of like struggling through a problem. They're both sticking to it um, until, they, until they find success. <coughs> 
which has been really awesome uh, in my classroom. Two other skills that are not in the slide, one of them is curiosity, so exploring new things. So students that have completed the playlist for our current unit are, are free to go and explore other topics um, and, uh, and work on their own, just to basically show their own curiosity. And then the last one is the gratitude. So making sure they treat, we, we talk about treating devices like a baby, uh, just to make sure that you're showing gratitude for, the, for, 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 for these opportunities that we get with the instructional technology. So for us, it's really important that whatever we implement is, is showing, is giving us the results that we're looking for. And so we've been really proud of our students' growth. We use the measures of academic progress to measure our students' growth from fall to spring, and also from spring to spring. And for the last two years, uh, my students in the fifth grade, 99% of them have achieved their growth goals um, for these last two years, which is the highest in the KIPP network of 162 skill, uh, schools. The most impressive part for me is that we're seeing growth in all the core titles. So students that are coming in at the lowest levels in the very first in the very first percentile, and also the students that are already coming at maybe the 75th percentile, percentile are all making um, their their typical growth, which is really exciting. Um, in in my my old model of instruction, I thought that I was most successful with the middle range of students, and I, I didn't really push my highest students as much. Or my or my lowest students. Um, so so using the small groups, using the instructional technology where students are working at their level and pushing themselves, um, ha have really given us amazing results. Plus, if you read the testimonials, you'll also see that just students just love it. Um, there, there are lots of students that want to come into the classroom early. Our school day starts at 7:25, and there, there are students that come to the classroom at around 7 o'clock just to get started ahead. Uh, a couple of students have told me that they, they woke up in the middle of the night because they had a mastery challenge on Khan Academy and they wanted to level up on those skills. Uh, and, then, and then also when we don't have school, days that we don't have school, either on weekends or on holidays or if we have a snow day, uh, I can check the report and we see that students are still working um, on, on the programs at home. And it's, it's really awesome that I'm able to check their progress as the students are working at home. So in, in these last two years that we've been working using these models of instruction for the math classroom, I've learned three really important key lessons and I wanted to share with you all. The first one is the importance of collaboration and making sure that students are making connections and, and talking through how they are solving the problem. It helps with making connections and it also helps with the, their accountability if they're held accountable to a teammate as they're collaborating. The second one is to make sure that you have a plan for what to do when students are stuck, which helps, um, which helps students increase in their autonomy and helps uh, push them to stick to harder problems so that they don't just give up when, it, when things get hard. And then the last, the last key lesson I w that I wanted to share is that the teacher's role is incredibly important in the classroom. It's not just a model where you just put a device in front of students and let them, let them, let them work. Uh, the teacher's role of guiding providing feedback and motivating students is, 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 is the centerpiece, I would say, to this model of instruction. Uh, excellent. Uh, so I uh, uh, will turn over to, to Dreambox in a second um, and, then, and then questions. But uh, first, I was kind of curious, uh, for anyone joining late, uh, does your entire school use this the same kind of model? You know, what does it look like throughout the rest of your school? So the, I would say, I would say yes. So the, the, the model of, especially in the math classroom, we now have three grades. So we have fifth, sixth, and seventh grade. And all three grades have a version of, of this model of math instruction. Uh, 
fourth, fifth grade, the computation block is a little bit longer than it is for the other grades because they're coming in with, with lots more holes in their instruction. Okay. Um, uh, all right. Oh, great. Uh, we'll get to, to uh, more of that in a second. Uh, but first, uh, I want to turn it over to, uh, to Kelly at Dreambox Learning, and, uh, and then we'll uh, come back and hear more from Silver. Thank you, Ross. Uh, my name is Kelly Erlacher. I'm a former sixth grade teacher, and I was in the classroom for 10 years. But now I'm a curriculum designer at Dreambox Learning. Our team at Dreambox is so happy to sponsor today's webinar. And thank you, Silver, for your thoughts and insights from your school experience. Um, Dreambox offers a rigorous and engaging pre-kindergarten through middle school math experience that helps students make sense of math and improve their achievement either online or with our uh, iPad app. At Dreambox, we know improving student understanding in math with technology doesn't mean just digitizing the age-old educational practices or putting students on a computer for 10 minutes after the classroom lesson is over. So therefore, Dreambox engages students in rigorous math content aligned with the same standards that Silver has mentioned. We have developed a motivating environment that uses our intelligent adaptive learning technology to create the personalized learning that he also was talking about. Dreambox improves learning uh, student understanding by asking students to think and solve problems independently. And we provide aligned reporting to different standards for the teachers, too. And we also have Spanish coming this fall. OK, excellent. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Uh, so now we'll go into our, our Q&A portion. Like I said before, if, you, if any of you have any questions, feel free to submit them. And uh, we will try and get to them. Uh, so, so I want to talk kind of about, uh, first of all, about implementation, uh, because I feel like um, that's a, a major area of concern for both administrators and teachers. Uh, so what was it like for you to go into a blended learning environment? What was your experience like as a teacher? Uh, so for me, it was definitely, I was, I was definitely a little bit nervous in the beginning, mostly because I, I just, I was used to a more teacher-centered classroom and so so letting go of control there was a little bit was a little bit challenging for me in the beginning right I I, it, it was, I had a hard time picturing what this was going to look like and so for me I think that um, separating it into computation versus problem solving was really helpful for me so in computation for fifth sixth and seventh grade it, it's mostly students working independently on their own device, right? And so, um, so there I was kind of just walking around the room, uh, conferencing with students, making sure that they're making the right choices, uh, that they're making the right decisions on which skills to practice or which program to use. And then in the problem solving class, that's where I would look at the, that's where I would look at the data from from the reports, right? And that's where I that's where I, that's where I make my small group instruction. And so I, I I still have one mostly one objective for the classroom, but then I in in the way that I group the students, I might have two or three groups. And so there might be one one group of students that has already shown mastery on the skill, and so that lesson looks a lot more like maybe one or two very rigorous word problems where the students are using modeling, where there's going to be some rich discussion happening about uh, happening around around how to solve this problem, right? And and showing lots of value to the different ways that students solve the problem. Um, and then for maybe for the students that are struggling with a certain skill, I use I, I have the same objective for them at the at the grade level, and which is also common core line, but I might use a lot more scaffold which includes more models, maybe bring in manipulative, um, and, and just uh, maybe me doing a little bit more examples before I give it off to the students so that they can try it on their own. So I think, I think, I think maybe separating those two actually helped, helped me wrap my head around how to implement this model here at our school. Okay. Uh, can you explain, one of the uh, people on our, our webinar wants to know, 
more about how you use manipulatives in this model. Sure. So, so fractions are are very big are, are a big part of fifth grade instruction. Uh, they're a major cluster in the fifth grade Common Core standard, and so for for students that have a hard time drawing out the the models, right, like the fraction bars or using some sort of like Singapore uh, style map, um, we can also use just like something that the students can can touch, whether it's uh, fraction pieces, so that the students can understand. Uh, you know, equivalent fractions, fraction addition, fraction subtraction. That has been really useful for some of, some, for some of our students. Okay, great. Uh, so another thing I'm kind of curious about, and some of other uh, viewers as well. Uh, so first of all, on the, on the um, oh, let me pull it up here. Uh, on this, uh, when you're talking about the, the blocks, uh, yeah. two or one hour blocks and the five other one hour blocks, uh, so, uh, just in case anyone missed it, uh, can you explain the difference in uh, there's 50 students in the uh, in the first set and then 30 in the in the second? So uh, people are just kind of wondering about the the 20 student difference there. Sure. So so one of the reasons I'll, I'll say like an alternative motive to have such a large student to teacher ratio is while I have half of the grade with me in the classroom, mostly working independently on a device. The other half of the of the of the of the of the of the grade is working in very small groups with every other teacher in the school doing guided small very small guided reading groups with about um, ten or five uh, students per teacher, and so I'm able to manage um, a room of fifty students because they're all engaged and they're all working at their own level, and we've already talked about well what to do what do I do when I'm stuck. So that way, I don't have 50 hands up in the air. Um, they're they're able to implement their own strategies on on what to do, which is, I think is a really great skill as as the students continue in their education, right? Like how to solve their own problems. Um, with the the second block, the problem solving block, that's the one that looks more like a traditional math classroom, um, where I teach one objective every day to about a group of 30 students, but my push is to decrease the amount of whole group direct instruction that I give in that problem solving block. And so I will group I will group those 30 students into two or three smaller groups that are more homogenous in their proficiency level. And so I'll, I'll target the objective to the proficiency level of those smaller groups. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think that makes sense to me. Uh, hopefully, if anyone else has any more questions, feel free to uh, ask them about uh, that specific area. Uh, so do the, uh, another thing to, for clarification, do the students, uh, are, are these computers theirs, or do they stay in the classroom? You know, do they bring these home? I mean, it's, it's, it sounded like they do, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, so we have uh, in in this in this classroom that's on the slide right now, there are always thirty five laptops that are that are attached to to the to the tables in the classroom, and so those are permanently there. Um, we also have we also have laptop carts and iPad carts so that we wheel them in for the bigger computation block, uh, and then we also have we we have one to one computing so we have one device for every student in our school because the devices are also used for a reading program that we have. They're also used for a nonfiction reading program that we use mm -hmm. here at our school too. Okay. Uh, what's your impression as far as how students treat their, their devices? Because uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of people are concerned with, um, with devices breaking and with students being, especially maybe at an elementary level, um, less than cautious with them. Yeah, so I mean, I think I think the emphasis on talking to students about gratitude, right? Um, being grateful to have these opportunities to have one-to-one -one computing, to have programs that you can use, so that you can to, that, that will help you learn, has helped us has helped us a whole lot, right? So we say instead of instead of using um, instead of spending money to replace the device or replace the headphone, we can use that we can use that money in other places of field trips and things like that. Um, and the students have 
have been really careful about how they how they use their devices. The having them all face towards the teacher also helps to make sure that we're uh, monitoring what the students are doing. Um, I, I think I think it's been successful in fifth and sixth grade. So that now that the students are in seventh grade and we're pushing them on their responsibility and independence, the students are going to travel with their own Chromebook. And so every student is going to be held accountable to, to that to that Chromebook. The students sign uh, sort of a policy agreement that they use the, the Chromebook in the way that the teacher is is directing them to uh, to make sure that they're using it to learn. Um, and that they're that they're taking care of it. I think I think that that accountability also would help the students. Okay. Uh, and along those lines, do they do they get any kind of digital ethics training? They they do. I mean, the 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 ethics training comes from it happens with the, with families. It happens with teachers. It happens with all of our students, even from before the first day of school. Um, and and. And, and all the participants not only sign um, documents to say that we're only going to use our devices in the way that the teacher directs us to, but um, we talk a lot about social intelligence, and so so it goes it goes beyond how we use the devices here in school. It also goes into how students are using social media outside of school um, and what they're what they're doing around there too. Okay, uh, so let's talk about assessment, because I think that's a huge area. How do you assess to know that students are you know, grasping these concepts and not just you know, kind of randomly clicking or um, you know, stuck? How, how do you, what kind of assessment do you use? Yeah, so, so we, 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 have lots of, we have lots of different metrics, especially in the math classroom. We have, I mean, we have the data from ST Math to see students pre and post quizzes to see how they're growing and to help the students understand like that growth, right? Um, before and after every objective on STMAP, the students take a quiz, which helps us see that growth. Uh, STMAP also gives us a report on which students are getting stuck on certain puzzles, and also the, their syllabus progress. Um, on Khan Academy, we get the level of proficiency for every one of our students for each one of the skills, which is really, really helpful for us as a teacher. Um, and that's what helps us make our small groups in the problem solving block. It helps us make small groups to pull out during our intervention block. And it also helps us talk to families about, because families come up to us asking, well, how do I, what's, can you give me some ideas of what I can do at home to help my, my son or my daughter? And so when we give them a, a report that's broken down by skill, the families are better able to support the, their students at home, right? Mm -hmm. um, we also have other metrics that we have here in New York as a region. So every, after every unit, we give a unit assessment that's helping us uh, gauge the mastery for each one of the units and each one of the major clusters on the Common Core Standards. We have interim assessments that are used for us as a, as a region, and then we, have, we use um, the Measures of Academic Progress map. We use that three times a year to making sure that the students are on track to make their, their growth goals, and then at the end of the year, we take the, the New York Common Core Alliance State Test as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, so for the, the problem solving blocks that you do, are those, are those technology, you said those are technology free? I mean, those are, um, or are students using their computers there? So, so in the problem solving block, the, the teacher does provide direct instruction, but to a smaller group, maybe uh, 10 to 15 students at a time. Or the, there, are, there are some groupings where it's me and two students, or me and one student, because those are the students that are coming in at a much lower level of proficiency. And while I'm, while I'm working with a small group of students, all the other students are working independently or, or in pairs on, on their own device. Okay. Um, do you ever feel like any of the students become device dependent? I mean, are you do you check to without the device to make sure that they're you know understanding these concepts? Yeah, that that's why I would say that it's really important. Like the role of the teacher is incredibly important, right? To making sure that 
the, the student has understood the objective at the level that Common Core asks for, right? Um, and so through through every the, the prob we changed the name of the math block to just problem solving block because every objective is, is taught through through word problems through a, a through a real life problem sort of scenario, and and the students are able to work, plow through plow through word problems. Um, have rich discussions around them, share the, the variety of solutions that they have for the word problem, and that's where, that's where it re it's really helpful to deepen students' understanding. And the teacher there is, is playing more of a, I guess more of a, again, like a, like a facilitator role, uh, but making sure that the teacher is assessing the student's deeper understanding through, through the word problems. And through the students' discussion. Okay. Uh, so, so I'll further along those lines, how what what was your training like to to come into this program? You know, how did your how did <laughs> the school prepare you? So, um, I I honestly was we we're, we we're, we we're one of the pioneers in our region, and so we 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 read as much as we could find on blended learning um, models. My principal went and visited other schools that were already implementing a blended learning model, and so he came back with some ideas. But it honestly was a whole lot of experimenting, um, refining, keeping what works, and 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 making what doesn't, making that better, um, and and just based on the students' results, uh, do we need more motivation? Do we need to increase the number of shout outs, did we need did we need to conference with students? Was the there was the amount of student choice that we're giving students appropriate? Um, and that's where like the conferencing comes in, collaboration comes in. And so we're still learning and we're still growing on and, and making decisions on how to make it better and what it's gonna look like for seventh and eighth grade as the students are growing too in our school. Um, but there there wasn't a whole lot of uh, of like PD that that we attended um, because we were like one of the first ones in our region to start it. What did you think were some of the more the more helpful resources? You mentioned reading uh, as much as you could. You know, was there anything particularly uh, useful that you found? So on the Khan Academy website, there are some videos and some sort of um, testimonials of how people in other areas have implemented. The, a blended learning model, or how they used Khan Academy. There was really uh, there was a TED Talk that won like TED Talk of the Year. I I, I referenced it in the article. Um, he talks a whole lot about. I think it was titled "The School in the Cloud," where he talks about using computers, having students collaborate around it, so that they can basically teach each other or teach themselves. And that that was that was really useful to to watch and to listen to, and to you know um, emphasize that collaboration piece in the model that we use. Okay, uh, and um, so what kind of what kind of professional learning do you get now? Um, so <laughs> for me, the the most important professional development that I get is 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 going and talking to other schools and other teachers. That are that are trying this out, right? We do a whole lot of sharing in, in our region and in conferences across the country. I know that you know we're, we're not the only ones. We're not the only ones doing this. So the more that we share best practices, the more that we share. Well, is there a product that's better, uh, or that does a certain aspect of blended learning better? Um, you know, is this going to be better for for our population? Is it going to be better for our community here at school? The more we share and the more we collaborate, I think it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to have great results for you know for everybody that's using it, um, because I don't think that there's one right way for every school to implement it. You really have to look at your own population, um, but that's why I also mentioned the like school administration support to making sure that the teachers are receiving the instructional coaching. Um, to you know, for for when they do their problem solving block, right, um, and and to make sure that that they're using best practices because that that's been that's been around longer. The the use of the instructional technology, you just have to make sure that you 
implement a, a great character education program to making sure that students aren't giving up on harder problems or more challenging problems, but that they're showing grit, they're showing optimism, and they have strategies on what to do when they get stuck. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, you mentioned collaboration and uh, a, a couple of times out here, um, and a lot of it was in the context of students, but I'm just curious. Um, cause a lot of teachers say that they don't uh, get enough time for collaboration, that um, it would be one of the more beneficial things to them than, say, you know, a lecture or um, you know, a conference. So what does collaboration look like at your school? You know, how much time do you get for it? Um, how beneficial is it? So um, this, this, this year, we have approximately two hours per week where the entire math department comes together to, to meet and to collaborate to, to solve problems in the classroom, to look at Common Core, to look at the models, and, and discuss what's working and what isn't working. Um, we also, this year, I'm, I'm providing support to the three math teachers in my, class, in my school um, as I'm, I'm the, the instructional coach for my school. And so principal, the principal has shown support in that way uh, to have me uh, not teaching full time so that I can go and do observations and, and meet with the teachers and then bring us all together uh, like I said, about two or three hours a week to collaborate um, here at our school, at a school level, right? As a region, so with other schools in the region, we come together about six times a year and, and share best practices that way. Aside from having very open lines of communication through email, phone calls, um, and other like less, less formal meetings. Okay. Okay. Um, now, I mean, Presumably, you know, every every computer also generally has a calculator with it. But, uh, um, you know, is there still a role as far as calculators go in your classroom, um, either separate or on the computer? Uh, so, the, we, we just bought a whole bunch of <laughs> TI, I think there are 84, okay. uh, for, for our students that are going to start algebra. And so, uh, we use, we, I know that the students are going to be, you know, there are some algebra standards where the students are expected to use the graphing calculator. And so at that level, yeah, definitely making sure the students are getting instruction on how to use the graphing calculators through lab about once per unit. Mm -hmm. And then uh, students in our sixth and seventh grade classes also um, use, you know, use calculators for, for some of the standards, like when we talk about pi, talking about circles um, and and to to use for square roots but that's about that's about as far as that's about as much as we do with calculators okay all right um, I want to read a comment here uh, from uh, Natalie Rankin who's on our on our webinar because I thought she made an interesting point uh, and, and we talked about this a little bit but um, let me see if I can find it. so she says I guess I'm just a little wary of an overuse of technology in the mathematics classroom and I'm having a hard time expressing it. Uh, hold on, one second, I lost it. I'm having a hard time expressing it, but I was wondering if anyone else felt the same. Uh, felt the same way. I feel as though kids are becoming too dependent on calculators or computers, etc., and it makes doing pure math more difficult. And so I was kind of wondering. You know, you talked a little bit about that, but you know, how would how would you respond to that? Yeah. So I would say that I would say when. When we first started using Khan Academy a couple of years ago, the exercises included a whole lot of computation-based exercises that weren't, 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 weren't as rigorous as we needed them to be, as, as was Common Core prescribed, right? Um, as Khan Academy has been growing, their exercises have gotten significantly better. There's a whole lot more um, problem-solving there are part-like responses, sort of a check all that apply or, or sorting exercises that, that has upped the rigor in those exercises and has prepared our students uh, to, to meet the Common Core learning standards. And I, so I would say that just because students are on a device doesn't mean that they're, that they're not being pushed. It doesn't mean that it's easier. Um, it's actually, it's actually 
it's actually very rigorous for, for our students. And um, and, and I, I just kind of reiterated it more the, the importance of the teacher's role, right? So when I, the, the, the reason that it's so important to have the devices in the classroom is for, in the problem solving block, it, it allows for you to personalize the instruction to a more homogenous small group so that you can work with a more manageable group because our, you know, for, for lots of schools in the country, class sizes are, you know, near 30 or maybe even more than 30 students, right? And so it's, 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 it's hard to reach every student when it's one teacher having providing direct instruction to a whole group of about 30 students. So having the, having the devices there where students can work at their own level, at their own pace, but then pulling the small group so that you can tailor your instruction to, to this proficiency level uh, for the students, I think, I think that that's just a giant benefit that I'm not able to do as one person with a group of 30 students. Without the without the use of instructional technology, and 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 push them as 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 much as I have pushed them these last couple of years. Okay. All right. Uh, do students do they generally seem like they're on track? Uh, I think a lot of teachers are probably worried about um, them maybe being off task uh, when they have a computer. I know that's like certainly. Uh, <laughs> Uh, theoretically working, but uh, you always have to. There's always that urge to check email or Facebook or something. Yeah, so I would say one quick tip is to make sure that all the screens are pointed to wherever you are. Uh, so, so make sure that all the screens are pointed with like towards the middle of the room if you're going to be circulating through the room uh, and and checking the task bars at the bottom of the of the screen. Uh, I know that that I know that, that that's going to happen. I know other teachers that. Have um, walk around with an iPad, and and all of the student screens are are able to be accessed through through the teacher's iPad. I personally don't don't use that, but I know others that do. Um, but uh, I think just uh, when when the students when when the when the session ends, right? Um, usually a report pops up, or you can access a report with the with the programs that we currently use in our school, and and that's one that's one really effective way to hold the students accountable to make sure that they were on task for however long the session was, uh, especially if the expectation is for students to have mastered a certain number of skills or to have worked on, on the program for a certain amount of minutes. Uh, and it, it, the reports are, are really great to have conversations with students, to have conversations with families around if students uh, have met the expectations. Uh, so, what is it like for students who come in below grade level, below the, where they're supposed to be? How do you how do you teach them? For students that are working below grade level, yeah, yeah. So, 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 I would say using 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 strategies that teachers hopefully are getting, you know, hopefully teachers are getting professional development around working with students that are that are that are that are working below grade level, right? Making sure, so what I've found is that the students, when they work in a homogenous group, right, even the students working at the low grade level, they feel, they feel very grateful to have a smaller setting. They, a lot of times their effective filter decreases and so they're able to, they feel more confident to participate, to answer questions, um, even to collaborate with each other. And because they know that they're all working at their own level, uh, and they feel more supported by the teacher. That has been my experience. Um, so that connected with all the scaffolds that the teacher implements with students that are working below grade level, whether it's using a skip counting grid, whether it's using different kinds of models or labeling or providing more examples for the students to use, um, that has really made a big difference in, in the instruction for for students that are coming in at below grade level. Okay. Uh, and along those same lines, um, what about uh, students with special needs or uh, or even English language learners? Are there different accommodations you make for them? Yeah, I I, um, I, I would make so so if if there are accommodations or modifications that come in the students' IEPs, then I definitely make sure that I include that 
in their instruction, their classwork, their homework, and their assessments, right? Um, but instead of, I, I, I never group a, I never group students. For example, I, I don't group all the emergent bilinguals together, and I don't group all of the students with IEPs together. I make decisions based on based on the data, right? Based on mastery. So if there's a student that receives special ed services or that has an IEP or that is classified as a mission bilingual, but that student has mastered skills, then that student will be grouped with all the other students that have mastered the skill, right? So the decisions are based on the data for that specific objective and not just because they're classified as a student that receives special ed services or that receives ESL services. Okay. On the, on the, the flip side, I suppose, is uh, for gifted students. Um, you know, what, what do you do for them? So yeah, so there, so there, there are definitely students that we have, um, I mean, it's, it's a few, uh, but there are some students that come in above grade level. We don't have, we don't have a gifted classification in our school, but there are students that, that test, uh, when we test them in the beginning of the school year, that test above grade level. And so a lot of times those students will work at a faster pace as the majority of the class. And so we encourage curiosity, we encourage them to go and explore new things. And for some of them, they, um, they, have, they have started um, digging into computer programming and coding, which I think is a, is a great complement to what we're doing in the classroom. They, 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 aren't always, they aren't always sort of opted out of the class lesson either. So they're still part of the, of the discussion when you have the small groups. And they still, we still push them to making sure that they're making connections, finding different ways to solve the problem. Um, and and, and uh, but but yeah, but they but they're definitely they're definitely also met at their own level, and which is where you know the, the more personalized way of learning with with leveraging the use of instructional te technology comes in, right? Um, so so all the other groups are working at their devices. And you have the, the group of students that is maybe working at a faster pace or has already mastered the skill. And so you're pushing them in, in, a, in a different way through word problems, through debate, through discussions, or through just different activities, including things like computer programming and coding. Okay. Uh, so between, uh, between the, the computers and uh, themselves and Khan and ST, uh, other, do, do those all collectively replace a traditional textbook? Is there a textbook? Um, yeah, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't used the textbook in a, in a while. I mean, we, we, not, not, as like the, not as the main component of, of the classroom. Um, we, we use it as supplements. There are some textbooks where I, where I, get in, where I grab investigation um, and, and also the calculator lab. But, but we don't we, we don't use a textbook and neither for its scope and sequence nor for for its uh, for its lesson. Okay. Um, one of the you mentioned a little uh, a few months ago that one of the you thought it would be really hard to do uh, to do uh, this kind of program without without the devices, and I think there are a lot of schools out there that would probably agree, and they but. You know, unlike your school, they don't have the devices, and uh, right. they, you know, financial the school financing is not a uh, is not exactly bountiful uh, in the country at the moment. So, so what would you say to teachers or administrators in those schools that don't expect to have a one to one program or don't expect to even have an in house uh, you know uh, program where every student's able to have uh, laptops? You know, what what can they do to apply at least some of these principles of your classroom? Uh, to theirs. So, so um, a couple of things here. I would say that for for school administrators, for example, it's, it's not it's not that our school has a unlimited amount of resources either. It's just that the way that the budget is is um, is used. For example, for example, there are no smart boards anywhere in our school, right? So I, I had a smart board at my at my previous school. Um, and, and we, we did have other, like we did have iPad carts, but every classroom had a smart board and not every one of the smart boards was being used the most, in the most effective way that, that it could have been, right? So that was sort of a misuse of, of, of funds there. Um, and so when I came to my current school, uh, I, I talked to my principal and said, well, 
it would be great if I could get a smart board. And he said, well, instead of getting a smart board, we could get a couple of carts of, of devices that the students could use. And so, so, so I would say at the school administrator level, um, determining how you're going to use your budget is really important. Um, However, I do, I, I do collaborate with other teachers that don't have one-to-one -one computing. And I would say just make sure that you have, you, could, you can make it in sort of a, sort of a, a, like set up some rotations, right? So maybe you have five or ten devices that you can use in your classroom. So you can have your small group that's working with you. You can have one station where students are on a device. And then you can have another sort of station where students are working on a performance test um, collaboratively. And so I think, there, I think there are ways that you can still personalize the instruction for students without having a one-to-one -one model. OK. OK. Uh, do you use a lot of, uh, of gaming in your classroom, or uh, is that pretty rare? Um, I we we don't we don't we don't really use gaming in the classroom. The the gaming that I've seen or something that's similar to gaming that I've seen in our school is um, students that are working on computer programming. They'll 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 look they'll look at, at games that other students have developed and posted and to give them an idea of what they can do as they're growing to, to animate and to create their own video games. Um, the FT math program looks like a looks like a game uh, with the with the visual puzzle, uh, but it's you know it's definitely not it's certainly not like a video game that that, that students are more more used to. Okay. Uh, all right. And um, uh, let me think. Uh, I just have a couple more questions here. Uh, uh, do you do, we talked about assessment a little bit before, um, is any of that performance assessment? Or, or do you have any kind of, do you use performance assessment as well, at all? Yes, yes, we definitely use performance assessment. Um, we, we, we can use them as sort of a separate, separate sort of uh, like station with the students as, as you're working with a small group. Um, or the performance assessment could be what the, what the teacher is, it's kind of like when, when the teacher is monitoring, um, that that could be that could also be it, it doesn't just have to be a paper pencil assessment, it, it could also be a performance assessment. Um, like I said, all of the all of the we push ourselves to make sure that the direct instruction that we're providing to the small groups are all sort of like real world problems and and all taught through a problem solving lens, including performance tasks and performance assessment. OK. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for your time here. Uh, I want to uh, ask you one more thing. But first, uh, I'm going to uh, once again hand things over uh, to Kelly at Dreambox Learning. Thank you, Ross and Silver. Dreambox is happy to sponsor this webinar. And I appreciate the time to be able to share more about the Dreambox Learning product. OK. To kind of just look here, I want to kind of go through three elements, rigorous math, um, the adaptive engine, and a motivating learning environment. Um, just like we were talking about, students really need to think critically and not just practice. We want them to have that visual learning as well as develop vocabulary and conceptual understanding at the same time. By having that true conceptualized understanding, the students will transfer that information into procedural fluency by the end of each unit by going through Dreambox as well. We are not just digitized worksheets. Uh, Dreambox Learning is a new technology that isn't doing the same old thing. And just like Silver had mentioned, we're looking for student-centered learning rather than the teacher or technology product leading the learning. We do not start lessons by saying, here's how we want to do it, go practice. For example, in fraction division, we wouldn't say just invert and multiply. We want them to have that understanding, and we require it. We want our students to understand the why before they're expected to show the how. We have full-time experienced classroom teachers on our team who work closely with the programmers and our creative team 
so that we're building really engaging uh, manipulatives for sense making and capture how students are thinking. Our adaptive engine, uh, looking at nonlinear progressions, we differentiate for every student and millions of unique paths. We go beyond just K-6, we now offer K-8 products um, for all kids to be able to receive what they really need. Dreambox can prover provide learning for all kids at their level, be it remediation or challenge. And how do we personalize learning? Well, we personalize learning by providing them the right curriculum at the right time with the scaffolding with that particular student's needs. We look at real time based on the student's mistakes and strategies. So if you're counting by ones, then you're going to need a different lesson than a student who might be counting by tens. We build our content and tools to be adaptive. Our experiment, experienced classroom teachers write our lessons to capture whether students are counting by ones, for example. And why each strategy tells us something different about what the student is thinking. Um, like Silver mentioned, we don't want kids to feel stuck, so we present it in different manners to help them gain understanding while providing them with real-time feedback. Here, the quality of pedagogy in math software is just as important as the quality of pedagogy in your regular classroom learning experiences. The schools that use Dreambox, we want them as a partner with great classroom experiences to support the student's mathematical development as early as preschool and all the way up through eighth grade. At Dreambox, we view technology as a vehicle for constant engagement rather than just content delivery. We don't start lessons with instructional lectures, like that would be appropriate for first graders or even seventh graders. But rather, we build highly visual, very interactive manipulatives that empower students to think in ways that can't be done using paper and pencil. You can see three of them here. We know that student understandings in math and technology doesn't mean just digitizing the kinds of instructions that result in skill replication without understanding. And that's because there isn't enough time for a teacher to make sure that all 30 or 40 students in the classroom is doing mathematics. We want them looking for that structure, just like the standards of mathematical practices require. Here, we actually see our robust reporting. So important for teachers to be partners with Dreambox and with their students in their classroom. We show highly individualized progress where you can see how students are spending different amounts of time using Dreambox to arrive at that same location. We keep achievement expectations constant while providing students with varying amounts of time they need. We also provide teachers with data to be able to use in their classroom for grouping or just to see where kids are achieving and what lessons the students are excelling in or even struggling with. Dreambox also provides one-click strategic grouping report so that students can know whether next week's scheduled lesson is an appropriate one for none, some, or all of their students in class. We do have Spanish coming this fall, which is an exciting thing to be able to share with you today. And a lot of other programs were mentioned in the presentation today. If you're considering them, I'd appreciate it if you would review Dreambox as well. We want you to be looking at all programs with really high expectations, and you'll see that Dreambox really does meet many of those. Dreambox has pioneered intelligent adaptive learning, different than just adaptive assessment, which is harder or easier problems. We care about the learning, not just the testing. And Dreambox is different because of the mathematical reasoning involved and manipulatives. We have created manipulatives that you can use in the classroom, such as like a math rack. And we've also used different manipulatives that you cannot use in the classroom because they just don't exist like a zooming number line or a moving axis on a coordinate grid. That's why it works for even preschoolers all the way through eighth grade. If you're interested in a free trial with Dreambox, please go to our website, dreambox.com, and we're excited to be releasing all of our Dreambox and Spanish this fall. Thank you for Silver and Ross for their time and everyone who attended today. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so I just wanted to... Um, uh, Sorry to, to go a little long here, Silver, but I, just, I wanted to ask you two short questions. Um, sure. Uh, the first one was you mentioned a program uh, that uh, you said you didn't use it uh, for your iPad uh, to see what all the other iPads in your, in your classroom are doing, but what was the name of that program? 
I, so I, I honestly don't know the name of the program. It was, it was a program that one of the teachers at my previous school used, okay. where she could, um, you know, she could just kind of like uh, remote access each one of the screens in the room. I don't know. I don't know what the name of the program is. I just know that it exists. Okay. Uh, and out of curiosity, why don't you use it? I, <laughs> I, 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 I would rather sort of like be walking around the classroom and making sure that I'm circulating to not only look at the student screen, but also to like uh, do one-to-one -one conferencing with the students as I'm, as I'm walking around. Okay, excellent. Uh, and last question, because um, this has been kind of circulating through the chat, is, uh, you know, we talked a lot about elementary and middle uh, levels here. Are, are you aware of any good resources that you think uh, maybe high schoolers should check out or high school teachers should check out? Uh, so I, I know that, so I had to take the practice this past summer, um, which included a whole lot of math, uh, skills from the, from high school level, and, and I used Khan Academy myself to, okay. to re re review uh, those skills that I hadn't seen in, in about a decade. Um, so Khan Academy is definitely one great resource. I don't know any others, but maybe people on, on the chat might have a, a better idea. Okay. All right. Uh, well, certainly a, a great grounding here in uh, elementary and uh, middle math. Um, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your contact info is up uh, there. And like I said uh, at the beginning of this webinar, uh, we uh, uh, will have a archive of this up uh, very soon. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope we got to as many of your questions as possible. And uh, we will most likely have uh, more math webinars uh, coming up in the next few months. Thank you again uh, to Silver, uh, to Dreambox, and uh, to my phenomenal webinar producer, Chelsea Boone.